series of the seas of Christian living, uh, we've covered crisis. We've covered culture, conflict, content, or content. And last week we talked about community, how that idea of fellowship is the glue to community that we not only get together for fellowship, but we get together to guard against error, spiritual error, that we also get together in fellowship to be a witness to those around us, a profession, a confession that God has brought us together in unity and that we live in unity with Christian love. Now, <clears throat> this week, right dovetailing into that, I want us to talk about that word confession. Now, I'm going to start with 1 Timothy 6, 12 to 14, rather than the scripture uh, Dad opened us up with. We'll get to that here in a moment. But 1 Timothy verses six or chapter 6, verses 12 through 14, Paul's closing off his letter, and he tells Timothy this, Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the, of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus who is in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul here is telling, telling young Tim, you made that good confession, now live up to it. All right? Now, <clears throat> this is the challenge with this word confession. It really means, I mean, if you were just to break it down into like parts, it means together speak. It means like together that you agree with the, the spoken word. So God is telling us something and we speak right along with it. All right. That's the confession. Now, <clears throat> in your Bibles, depending on your version, but even in one version, It'll, uh, they will translate this word as confess or profess or acknowledge. Now, I think it's all fine, but I think what we need to do is understand what we mean when we say confess, profess, or acknowledge. And I think it's a process. Like, acknowledge means to accept or admit or recognize. Like, you finally come to the realization that Jesus is the Christ. You recognize that. You admit it. And you accept that fact. So you acknowledge it. Then you confess it. And confessing, which is different than professing, confessing is like finally saying, yeah, I may have been thinking about this, but now I'm going to confess I believe it. So is something hidden that you confess? From that point on, it's professing. It's expressing what now outwardly what you have come to be settled with in, in your life. All right? So I want you to keep that process in mind as we talk about the three things today. Acknowledgement, accepting, admitting, recognition, then confessing because you're going to proclaim what something was inside you that you've settled inside you. You've confessed it out, but from then on you profess it. To anybody who will hear it, it will work for any of these points that we're talking about today. And whenever you hear me read the word confess today, I've made sure it's the word that Paul used up here, and it can mean confess, profess, or acknowledge. 
All right? Okay. So let's get into it. Romans 10, 9 and 10. You probably could quote it to me. Romans 10, 9 and 10. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes, that's the acknowledgement, that's the recognition, that's admitting to yourself, it's true, that God raised him from the dead. Oh wait, it's with your heart that one believes and is justified, it's with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Then you confess it. Oh, I like to keep my... my my belief and my, my relationship private. There is no private in this. There is no private in this. There's confessing. And from that point on, it's professing. You can privately decide, accept, admit, and recognize, but eventually you better confess it. Because it's with your heart you believe and are justified. It's with your mouth you confess and are saved. See, it's the rubber meeting the road. Right? We've talked about this before. I now believe. I admit I recognize. I moved away from there. Sorry, Don. I'll talk loud. I don't have my mic on. <laughs> that this chair is a chair built... For me to sit in. I believe it. I settled it in my heart. So there. Somebody asked me to sit in it. Ask me. No thanks. I'd rather keep that private. I will never sit in a chair in front of you all. That's a private thing. No. It's between me and God. No. See, eventually God has got to sit down. Yeah. See, look, I believe it. See? I look, I believe it. Eventually I got to confess it. And from that moment on, I'm professing it. Because it's part of our Christian life. Sure, acknowledge. But then confess it and profess it. Okay? That's what Jesus is saying in Matthew 10, 32 and 33 that Dad read us already. Matthew 10, 32 through 33 so everyone who acknowledges me before men, that word acknowledge is confess, is profess. It's the same exact word as we read in Timothy. Same exact word. Strong's 3670, if you want it. That word, so everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. Whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. You get what you ask for, or don't. See, that's the thing. <clears throat> over and over, we see this idea of professing, confessing, acknowledging. Uh, even John, in his letters... We, which we covered, what, two years ago? Last year? I don't remember. 1 John 4, 15. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. It's confessing it. It's professing it. It's acknowledging it. Now, the thing is, all through the, the book of John, I just picked out a couple John chapter 9, verses 20 through 23. We had secret disciples. John 9, 
the story of the man born blind since birth. Right? Born blind since birth? Isn't that? That's the only way you can be born blind since birth. Sorry. He was, he was born blind. He had been blind since birth. Oh, yeah, yeah. John 9, verses 20 through 23. This is his parents' response to it. His parents answered when, when they were questioned, what happened to your son? They said this. We know that this is our son and he was born blind, but how he... How he now sees, we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he's of age, he will speak for himself. Well, that sounds pretty normal. But look what the verse 22 says. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Fear of man. It's the fear of man. Rather than acknowledging and confessing, professing that Jesus is the Christ. Look at John 12. 42 through 43. Nevertheless, many, of, many even of the authorities, believed in Jesus, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it so that they would not be put out of the synagogue, for they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. It was a condition, and I think it still is a condition, because sometimes we'd rather just be good people than Christians. Right? We need to be sure that we profess the reason for our change, not just that we're awfully good people. See, Proverb 29 says, The fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. Don't let the fear of man keep you from confessing why well, I'm hoping we're to the point of professing. I think every one of us, uh, at least here, have come to the point of acknowledging, accepting, admitting, and, and uh, recognizing that Jesus is the Christ. I pray, though, we're all to the point of professing because confession should have been done by now. Yes, I've settled it in my heart. Now I need to confess before men that what I did used to not believe, I believe now. I believe it. And now from now on, I'll profess that I am a follower of Christ. No matter what you may do to me. Now, in America, whoop-de-doo. I mean, what are they going to do? M mock you? But in Thailand, they could, well... At the best, send you home. At the worst, put you in jail. And who knows, in Burundi right now, they're open to it. But just north in Rwanda, they've shut it down where they used to be really open to it. You, you just have to be willing to confess and profess. All right? So that's the first point I want us to, to come to today is that we need to confess that we are followers of Christ. Profess it. Okay? Now, the second thing with confession and, and um, I think this acknowledging is in 1 John 1, 9. And again, I'm sure you probably could quote it to me. Uh, 1 John 1, 9. Who... Uh, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This idea here is true confession. And this is what I mean by that. If we really go back to what I said at the beginning, that
that acknowledgement is kind of that first step in, in uh, this process, that you have to accept, admit, and recognize that what you did is sin. What you're thinking is sin. What you're doing is sin. Then it comes to the point we need to confess it. It was previously hidden, but now I'm making it known. And who am I confessing it to? My Lord and Savior. My advocate, right? <clears throat> That's the one that we know who we need to confess to. We need to acknowledge that what we've done, accept that we've done wrong, acknowledge it, recognize it, but then confess it to him. See, over and over in the uh, Psalms and Proverbs, I just picked a couple, like I said. Psalm 32, verse 5. I acknowledged that word in the, the Septuagint when they, they tr uh, translated this to Greek. They used the same word. I acknowledge my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Proverb 28. The book of wisdom, 28, verse 13 and 14. Whoever conceals his transgression will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. Blessed is the one who fears the Lord always, but whoever hardens his heart will fall into calamity. See, there's two points I want to make here that Proverbs makes about confession. First, uh, but he who confesses and forsakes. Confesses and forsakes his transgressions, his iniquity. It's not confesses and repeats the offense. Because, you know, um, I can do whatever. I'm free in Christ and I can always just come and ask for forgiveness. The thing is, all that is, is verse 14, hardening of the heart. Right? I, whenever I see hardening of the heart, I think of calluses. Calluses don't come easy. Right? The first time you get ready to build a callus... Often it comes with a blister, and it hurts, and it, it, it wounds you. But then you keep doing what you got to do, and pretty soon it hardens and becomes a callus. That's the way sin is. Unconfessed sin hurts at first, but then if you ignore the hurt and just keep on doing it, pretty soon it's not so bad. Your heart's hardened. We have got to, when we are hurt by the sin that we commit, and maybe unknowingly, and then it's brought to our attention, then we need to confess it. We need to confess it to the, to the one who is our advocate, the one who is there to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. <laughs> this is not... Um, this idea of confessing and forsaking is something that Jesus carried on in his ministry. In John chapter 5, verse 14, this is the pool of Bethesda, the man laying there for years trying to get into the waters that are stirred. Jesus tells him to stand up and walk. But then he finds him later and says, sin no more. He doesn't just forgive him his sin. He says, you're forgiven, but sin no more. Stop it. Same way with the woman caught in adultery. In John chapter 8, when Jesus looks up from whatever he's doing in the sand, writing names or whatever, he looks up and says, where are your accusers? They're nowhere. And he says, well, neither do I. I will not accuse you. Go and sin no more. Right? Not go back to what you were doing. Go and sin no more. See, we're called to not just confess our sin, but to forsake it. And that's where I think James 5.16 comes into play. Because James 5.16 is really the hard, 
I think, not often preached in kind of a hard verse that says, therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Uh, uh, sometimes, and I believe this, I think there are there is sin in your life that you confess to Christ for forgiveness but it has such a strong hold on you and it's got such a routine in your life that you just need to say, brother, Frank, I am struggling with this sin. I'm, I'm telling you, I'm confessing to you that I'm struggling with this sin. Hold me accountable. Help me through this. Now, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe none of you, maybe none of you will ever get to that point. But I know in college, I was and I had to. I had to find an accountability partner I could confess to. And he held me accountable. We made mistakes, of course. But... He helped me through that struggle with that, well, previously unconfessed sin. So I think an important part of the C for Christian life in confession is, uh, one, confess that Jesus Christ is Lord publicly. Second, confess your sins. Once you realize it's a sin, confess it first to Jesus Christ for cleansing but then, if necessary, don't let it harden your heart. Find somebody that can help you fight it and confess your sin one to another so they can pray with you and you can get over, start scraping off that callus. All right? Third. The third thing I say about confession is really more like profession. Psalm 35. Psalm 35, 18 says, I will thank you in the great congregation, in the mighty throng, I will praise you. I will thank and praise you. That's the bank. Thank and praise. I will thank and praise you. That acknowledgement, confession, profession, that, that part of our worship where we stand and we give praise to God during prayer and worship. Praise and worship. Praise and prayer time. When we sing our hymns, acknowledging the goodness of God. So, I... I all of the Psalms, all of the Psalms. Psalm 29, ascribe to the Lord, O mighty ones, ascribe to the Lord, glory and strength, ascribe to the Lord, the glory to his name, worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. That profession that Jesus, that God is Lord of my life, that Jesus Christ has come and changed me. Professing that, that's kind of what we do here. That's part of our worship service. Why? Well, because I sure haven't felt it. But look, everybody is coming together and professing. I can look at the goodness of God and know that God is still on the throne. I may be struggling right now, but I know God is still working in people's lives. Right? You can be encouraged by that. Uh, uh, Psalm 111. I almost read all these, but we're, we're going to wrap this up. I mean, all verses in these. Psalm 111. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright, in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Read that whole verse, oh, oh, 10 verses. Not very long. Right? That, that's the thing. Re remember, remember what, what has been done. 
It encourages us. It brings us up out of the pit. That professing the move of God helps us to be encouraged and strengthened. See, that's part of the importance of confession. To encourage you, even to, in, to encourage each other. All right? So that's why um, next week, is it next week? What did I say next week is? Oh, charity. No. Here in a couple weeks, we're really going to look at uh, Ephesians 4. For one, but I want to talk about it today. I, therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. See, walk like that. Walk like that so that you are a living letter to all those around you. Profess that Jesus Christ is your Lord. When you have un... Um, uh, Unconfessed sins, confess it. If you need find, if you need to find help, find it. But then when we're together, profess. Let people know what God is doing in your life. It might just be the thing they need to hear to be encouraged themselves. Amen? But all, above all, all of this is to walk worthy of the call that we are called. Amen? All right. The Sea of Confession. Uh, so with that, I'm going to encourage you to turn to Chorus 123, and we're going to sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. Chorus 1, 2, 3. Listen. whether we're out with our friends, whether we're out in public, let us profess what you've done for us and what you can do for others. Let us be a living profession, living acknowledgement, a living confession of who you are. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed. <laughs>